<laughs> you don't hear me. My apologies. So thanks for joining us. Sorry we got started a few minutes late. You're joining us for the Aspire series on Concept Planes 101, what they're for, and, what, and how to do them. We have two presenters today. The first is Ms. D. Garza. She's the Chief of Concept Plans Branch within the Manpower Division at MedCom. The second is Lieutenant Colonel Mike Richards, who is the Director of Financial Policy within uh, RM, and he's up here at OTSG. So we thank you for joining us today. Um, they're both going to run through their sections uh, about concept plans, and then we'll talk about the um, cost-benefit analysis, and then we'll have time at the end for your questions. You can answer or you can ask questions at any time in the Q and A pod, and uh, we'll either answer them intermittently or we'll take them at the end as a group. And then, and then, um, as always, there are files for download in the file share pod, and there are a lot more resources for you to download within the library of our SharePoint site. And the link to that site is in the web link. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. D. Garza, who's going to introduce the concept plan. Sarah, can you see my files? Uh, yes, Dee, you're, 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 you're up and live, and I believe everybody can hear you at this point in time. Okay. Um, as mentioned, the Concept Plan Branch uh, is under the MedCal Manpower Division, under Dr. Mark Perry, and uh, Belinda Elliott, Diana Padilla, and Jennifer Berry work with me in this, on this endeavor. So to get us started, we're, here's the... Dee, is it possible you could speak a little louder? They're not able to hear you right this second. <clears throat> okay, is that better? Louder, Dee. Hi. Hello? This good? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, people are starting to respond yes. That's, that's better. Okay, okay. So um, we're going to briefly... My, my hope is to go through these briefing slides quickly so that we can get into the actual format and development of, of the concept plan. So uh, if you have questions, just shoot them via the DCO, and, and I'll try to address those before we go offline. Otherwise, you're welcome to call the office uh, after this is done. OK, so we're going to look at the definition, the purpose, regulatory guidance, a, a proving authority, threshold, the determination process, requirements determination process, uh, bill payers, funding strategies, um, all, all the things that, that make the concept plan uh, pass scrutiny at Army levels. Okay, so let's start with uh, the manpower regulations. And, and these, this this verbiage is straight out of out of the Army regulations. Okay, uh, the concept plan is a detailed proposal. Anytime you're going to create or make a major change to one or more units, uh, when when the level of change it says when the level of change reaches a specified threshold, the, the guidance that's in in place now is the concept plan guidance of 2010. And it reads that the threshold is one. However, having said that, uh, today Army G3 is, is meeting with, with uh, commands, uh, ours included, to see if possibly we can change the way we do uh, concept plans and the threshold may change. So it would be wonderful to have a threshold of, of more than one. So more to come later. Literally, that meeting is, is starting today at 2 o'clock. OK, so the purpose of a concept plan is, is to ensure that uh, the resources uh, support Army priorities and objectives. There are plenty of things that people want to do, stand up, stand up uh, functional areas and, and, and things that they'd like to do. However, when Army G3 reviews reviews our concept plans, they're looking to see how that's going to fit into the priorities uh, that they have that, that they have to meet. 
for, for instance, if um, the army objectives are moving out of out of Europe and over to Perm uh, over to Pacific, a concept plan increasing or or is trying to stand up missions at Europe would probably not be looked at favorably. Okay, so the concept plan is used to request approval of an organizational structure, and we look at all aspects of, of what it takes to stand up an organization, which is personnel, equipment, and, and facilities, just, just everything. Okay, so let me... Here's the regulatory guidance that we abide by. And I'm, I'm not going to read that to you if this is accessible out online. We also have a, a URL um, that we can provide that, that has some of these documents in there. OK, so on the, this, this is showing you who approves our, our concept plan. Once your concept plan has been developed, has gone through the scrutiny of, of this office, and, and when I say that, I say that in the kindest way. Uh, um, it must pass. We know, or we've been working in concert with, with these entities, so we know what it is that, that they want to see what, what is acceptable and, and what isn't. So that's what I mean by that. These are not subjective by, by any means. Uh, from us, I mean, we we um, we bounce it against the requirements that are given to us via these agencies. So when a concept plan is is finally is finalized, we send it up to Army G3. There, the Army G3 person disseminates it to the R staff, to USAMA, which is the Manpower Analysis Agency, and to the DASI, which looks at our cost-benefit analysis, and to USAFEMSA that looks at the TDA crosswalks. USAMA, of course, looks at workload. And Army G3 looks at, at just about everything else, because all of the R staff is looking at it. And you'll see more of this in a minute. There you go. Here are some of the things that each, each one of these entities are looking for. The, the mission directive is critical, and it must it must be directed by a general officer or higher. If it comes from um, Army, okay. So if if it's an Army directed, sometimes they're Army directed concept plans. And, and we just add our, you know, we do our review and then disseminate it to, to the entities that are impacted by it. But they do look at, at, at funding, bill payers and funding are a, are a big part of getting your concept plans accepted. If you, if you don't have bill payers, and we'll talk about that again a little further down, uh, bill payers, funding strategies, or mission directives that, that are, are not included in the concept plan are non-starters. OK, so um, the USAMA will look at uh, methodology, whether we complied with uh, the, the methodology that they used to, to do requirements determining, which is a methodology for all manpower people. It's a, the manpower is a program all the way from, from the activities to the Army level, Army Secretary level. OK, so DASA, DASI looks at, within the concept plan, a cost-benefit analysis is, is required. And, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Richards will address that in a minute. Um, and they, they review our, our are costing and, and whether we did it right or not. I won't I won't stay on that because he's going to address that later. Um, of course, uh, use of FAMSA, uh, that's the force management support agency, 
we'll look at uh, our baseline, the baseline TDA, and the and the crosswalk, which is the proposed TDA. The baseline TDA is usually the most not usually, is always the most current approved TDA. And they compare that to where you want to go, the proposed TDA. Okay, events that, that trigger a submission of a concept plan, again, these, these things are straight out of the regulation. Uh, unprogrammed TDA organization that you want to add to the force. Uh, any deviation from the organizational structure. Um, a mission mission change, really anything that increases or, or encumbers the Army for money. And, and so reorganization also uh, above directorate level. And the establishment of, of AMHA uh, headquarters and, and also a mission of a movement, a major reorganization or a, a move from one command to another. Okay, so this continues on with, with some of the thresholds or, or what Army is looking at that would constitute a new requirement or a new concept plan. And, and uh, any new military requirement, any new civilian requirement. And I should have said this at, at the on, onset, but we are only addressing traditional concept plans and not insourcing concept plans. The insourcing concept plan, while it does contain many of the same uh, formatting as, as a traditional concept plan, they, they, the enclosures and, and the analyses that has to be done is different. So we won't address that this time. Um, so there you can look at, at some of the, the uh, thresholds again, documentation of contractor requirements. Well, we know that that's, that's old. Uh, because they're not on the TDAs anymore. And uh, insourcing concept plans, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but they involve uh, looking at the PDC and working with MNRA, Dr. Anderson, and his staff. Okay, so uh, any increases in specified number of, of requirements or authorizations. Okay, and all, everything must be workload based. A, a lot of times, um, entities will will stand up and and they'll say, "Well, we don't we don't have any workload. Workload is a statutory requirement, and that mission you, you find a mission that you know it. Who has been one of the questions in the concept plan is who has been doing this? You know, if if this has been done by someone else who has been doing it and, and you know, put questions of that nature that kind of guide you towards, uh, you know, collecting workloads. It's also, sometimes we, we do concept plans, like I said before, directed by headquarters army. I think the one was sharp. We just uh, went over this, it's the same authoritative sources, and it, and it tells you a little bit of, of why we do requirements determining. And, and in my area, while we're doing requirements determining, we do requirements determination for new units only, 
a new organization for missions standing up. Right now, we're, the missions or the concept plans that are getting priority are those that are congressionally mandated. Uh, the Centers of Excellence, for instance, and uh, usually concept plans that require research that's mandated by Congress. Okay, to have to have a valid process, this this is by manpower regulation. First, of, the first and foremost is you must have an enduring mission. A, a lot of times, uh, organizations will perform will perform work because it's either not not being done by those that are that have been given the mission, or or they're not happy with the product that they're getting from that organization. But that does not constitute uh, that it becomes your mission. So uh, just just remember that in the scheme of things, that even if you hire the people to do the work, it cannot be it cannot be accepted as part of your mission if it is indeed not your mission. Um, one of the things to look for, I I know that uh, we have a tendency to look at at those times that consume most of our of our resources or, or when we're we're terribly busy. But when when doing a concept plan and you're, and you're capturing workload, you cannot look at mission at inception because we all know that it, it takes a lot of resources to get a mission stood up. So you don't look at extreme high, highs and lows and the same thing with cyclical cyclical work. When you're capturing 12 months of, of work, you, it, it has to be average workload, not the highs and not the lows. Okay? It must also be minimum essential requirements. What does it take to open the door? And that's, that's again, is by statutory requirement. It must be based on workload, on the actual work being performed. Okay? And when looking for, for uh, workload counts and that kind of thing, it would behoove you to look at authoritative systems that that measure workload, such as some of these that I've, I've put in here. Because you can you can count the number of TDAs you produce out of your area, or you can go to MEPRS and, and, and download workload if you're in the hospital in the MTS. Um, so the the data is stored. Um, this, this again is a, is a Dr. Perry uh, comment about where the data is stored. I personally don't go into into M2, um, but I have staff that do, so I I can't address that any further. Um, the USMA is charged with validating and approving or disapproving. Again, they look at our methodology. Uh, so so many times we we hear. Well, the chief of staff said, and and um, the the general wants this. the The thing is that, aside from an authoritative source, uh, we need we need to understand that the TDA is an army document, and we get to to have our resources tracked via that document. But it does belong to them. That's why we have to wait on the Army update, the TDA update, to make changes to our documents. So any any change to the workforce has to be Army approved or fit into the Army process, the Army manpower process, in some kind of way. And 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 so it's it's not just a matter of can I move. You know, this year, or can I change this MOS or AOC to this, or can I trade this for that? It, the, all of those things is, is what USMA looks at, and and based on, and that's why we do the, the work up front with you to get those kinds of things negotiated to the proper organization that takes care of that, be it uh, APPD, HR, or G8, or, or who Ever to, to get this information so that we can we can pass through USMA with, without losing any of the resources that we that we say we need. Okay, and uh, the data time frame when looking for for uh, when 
looking at your data resources, uh, again, you look at, at the time frame that is most average for you. Um, because they will ask us, what time frame did we look at? And I'd like to be able to say the last 12 months. And, and, you know, and, and if that doesn't represent average, then we can make the additional comment that uh, this, this, this cyclical work or, or that it, it represents average because we had to take, you know, we had to adjust it or normalize the data. Okay, and then once uh, these different entities, it's not just USMO, once all these different entities look at our concept plans, they, they make comments and they, they call us, and if we can answer the question based on, on what we've learned from you, we, we do that. But in the reclama process, we, we engage you to, to work with us to respond to these different arm, uh, Army staff elements that are asking questions. Steve, before you go on, this is Colonel Richards. Can you go back to slide eight, please? Uh, we lost some information. We weren't we were not able to hear you due to a hot mic. Okay. Eight. The uh, headquarters continues to provide oversight. Okay. Is that, is that the one you're looking it, at? If you can cover that one in slide nine again, I think the group okay. would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, not a problem. Uh, this is just a continuation of of the same uh, of the slide before we were looking at, at um, what triggers a concept plan and and any new military basically any new military requirement any new civilian requirement um, documentation of of, of uh, contractors and and um, I hesitated on that because we don't put uh, CMEs on, on the TDAs anymore, however, there is talk that we may possibly go back to that, but don't shoot the messenger, okay? It's not official yet that there's, uh, Army G3 and the company are still discussing that. Um, on how to how to work that process with uh, MNRA, <clears throat> the people that, that handle the PDC and, the, and, the, and that are monitoring contractors now, or at least tracking how many we have. Um, so I, I won't address, and I said this before, I won't address all that it takes in an insourcing concept plan because it, it is too much to, to try to get in in the time we have today. So um, we can do an insourcing, maybe we can do an Aspire insourcing concept plan, Sarah. So anyway, um, also any increases in, in requirements uh, based on a headquarters on, on headquarters uh, directives like EEO advisors and that kind of thing, but all all requirements must be workload based. That that is a statutory requirement. I can't say that enough. Um, a concept plan prepared by headquarters Army um, that that directs us. I, I think the last uh, one we had from Army direction was. Uh, the sharp concept plan uh, that was done at Army level. That was done at Army level, and um, it was top loaded. The resources were top loaded from uh, use of that stuff. Okay, and also any any increase to the MOG TDAs, basically, or all TDAs uh, require a concept plan. This. This is a, a slide that uh, Dr. Perry had in a previous manpower uh, briefing that he did. I thought it, it had some good information, but it's basically the same guidance uh, that is our, is our authoritative source for, for doing requirements determining. And, and it, there, was a, there was a time when we used the, uh, the ASAM model and, and we were able to move requirements and uh, requirements around if you stayed within the same uh, within the same functional area and, and that kind of thing. We had, we had a lot of latitude. That is gone. That is gone and, and that's why we're, we're inundated now with, with paperwork and, and, and the 
concept plan process or the command implementation process uh, because the Army, Army wants to see what is going on. But again, there's a meeting today. Some of that may, may lighten up a little bit, hopefully. <clears throat> In the requirements validation process, these, these are things that you absolutely have to have to, to meet the scrutiny of, of, of Army, is that it must be an enduring mission. Uh, I mentioned that you cannot uh, use assumed work in, in, in capturing workload for yourself, meaning if it's somebody else's mission uh, and you're, you're performing it, even if it's for a good cause, you cannot count that workload. In, in your data collection. Hey, Dee, this is Colonel Richards again. Uh, we, we're good on this slide. This is, uh, I believe, everyone was able to capture everything okay, you just great. said on this. Thank you.
the concept plan process calls for that strategy to be included in your document. That is part of, of the consideration that Army will give to approving your, your process or your concept plan. Okay, we also have another situation where, where there are missions that are being funded and, and so people will come and they'll say to us, well, we have money. Yeah, well, money is not a, a funding strategy. Um, an authorization is a commitment to strategy. That, that's a, so what am I saying? That we have to have bill payers. Um, because uh, very often, you know, functionals come up here also asking uh, without the total number of bill payers that that they are needed. Let's say they're asking for, for 37 requirements, and um, they can only come up with 30 authorizations from reprioritizing lower missions. The, the other seven, you know, they, they expect that MedCom can can find those, and if that happens to be the general's priority, then that might be a possibility, but not always. Even if it is her priority, uh, we may not have them to, to, you know, we may not be able to afford to give. So a, a big part of getting concept plans approved this, at this day and age is to have is to have bill payers and a solid funding strategy. Um, so aside aside from bill payers, one one of the things that uh, <clears throat> I want to say too is that there is no great growth. That uh, is is a recent uh, directive out of out of uh, Army G3. Is is that without an approved uh, job description or uh, approved PD, there is no no great growth. It used to be we we'd say that the TDA is just a is just a uh, a placeholder, but no more. Now now they're watching for that as well. Again, anything that encumbers the army or encumbers you know us to to, to have a bigger bill than we currently have is going to be scrutinized. Okay, I would like uh, to go into the uh, I'm hoping everybody's still there. I want to show you the uh, format for a concept plan that we can go through quickly and uh, you can see this. This is just a cover sheet for the executive summary. It just gives you uh, an idea if up front. Excuse up me, Dee, this is Colonel Richards. Could you yes. please zoom and make your uh, Word document bigger so everyone can see it, please? Thank you. Uh, okay, this is the cover page. And this is the uh, executive summary. Executive summary can't be more than one and a half to two pages. In the executive summary, we want you to right up front say what it is that you need. As, as this example shows, we, we're requesting the establishment of, and, and for your information, a concept plan is a requirements document only. We're, we're requesting requirements, approval for requirements from the Army, and we we, between us, we come up with the, with the bill payers. Unless it is an Army concept plan or Army has directed that we do a particular mission that they are willing to pay for, then we get into a, another process. But, but the concept plan overall is a requirements determining process. Okay, so then uh, you can see that the authoritative directive is is up front, and the, what what you want to say in, in the in the executive summary is is how why you're you're doing this. What is the capability gap, or or if you have an opportunity to to stand up an organization 
um, that this is the this is the best way to, to do this. I want to show you the uh, concept plan, the actual concept plan, because uh, Colonel Richards is going to address the cost benefit analysis here shortly. And if we don't finish, it's it's okay. At least you have the the example here or the format that you can look at. Uh, this this was actually not meant to be a, an, an in-depth uh, uh, process review, and and so hopefully this is enough to get, to get you started if you have to do a concept plan. But again, the references are your authoritative sources. Also, why we do a concept plan, which is the manpower authoritative sources, and uh, the purpose, why you why you're doing this. And uh, if, if uh, Colonel Richards, if you're ready, sir, uh, you can hit the uh, you can tell us about the cost benefit analysis process. Colonel Richards, ladies and gentlemen, this is Colonel Richards. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and bring up the cost-benefit analysis. And at this point in time, that? at this point in time, the, uh, the cost-benefit analysis uh, chart should be up. And I'm going to go ahead and go through this. And let me go ahead and get started on this piece real quick. Um, for a cost-benefit analysis, in essence, what this is, what, what this product is, is a decision brief. The intent is to come up with a decision based off some financial information. And specifically, this process comes from the cost and economic division underneath the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Financial Management and Comptroller. This is one tool, and this tool also happens to be a key part of a concept plan. This tool is also used throughout the Army for the POM and for unfinanced requirements as well. Uh, the purpose and outline for today, this, brief, this part of the brief itself is just going to be roughly about 10 to 15 minutes. Just so you know, there, there are multiple training venues out there. There's a four-day course, a four-hour course. And this is also nest with the Army's cost management uh, concepts that are out there. And there are several courses that feed into that as well. One of the things as we go into and talk about doing a concept plan, going in and talking about cost benefit analysis, talking about cost management, why the emphasis? As this community knows, as we know within the Army Medical Department, our fiscal environment has changed. That's not just for the AMED, that's obviously DOD and in fact the entire federal government. What I'm showing, what I'm showing here on this slide is just some of the key uh, stressors that we have been recently been uh, uh, feeling. Um, uh, I'll kind of highlight that we have lost uh, roughly, initially we were going to lose uh, a little less than 6,000 MENCOM civilians. We have just won a major fight in which case we were able to get about 2,727 of those positions restored, which goes to communicate that we are still fighting a fight to maintain what we have. So as we talk about concept plans with new missions, we have to be cognizant that we have to have a very solid, strong argument. And a cost-benefit analysis is the mechanism to build that argument. So what is a CBA? Very sh bottom line up front, it is a decision brief. As Ms. Garza just emphasized, when we submit a CBA, there are two products that we're submitting, a decision paper and a decision brief. It, looking at the template that Ms. Garza just showed you, a CBA right after the executive summary is, is one of the key components. And inside there, it is basically following what we're, what we're used to in the Army, which is following the military decision-making process, adding to it financial information. Now, the CBA process has eight specific steps. 
I'm only today I'm only going to cover three what I would say are key steps with uh, in this presentation that's out there on the Aspire series we have a link there that you may go out there and, and get to that you can get this entire brief that has about another 30 uh, hidden slides that go into each and every single one of these steps what you'll also notice underneath that link is that each of these steps has a separate presentation that goes into more detail and that's going back to the four-day course that the Department of the Army teaches. The key aspect I want to sit there and emphasize on this is that we're looking at the benefits in regards to cost. And so a CBA is not necessarily going out there and saying we need to find out cost savings or cost avoidance. That's not what a CBA is doing. What we're doing is we're saying given a problem, given a new mission, what is the best alternative to achieve that mission given certain cost uh, realities? So when we're looking at cost, we're looking at uh, definitely all the things that are quantifiable, as you can see, direct, indirect, sustainment, salary and benefits. And again, as we are creating a new position, a new office, and let's say we plan to you know how much military civilians and contractors we need to price out all of those yes we need to price out the military because we're going to go back to the army and say we need new authorizations we still have to give a bill payer strategy but we also have to show the army if they are going to put new authorizations to to this alternative that we're presenting how much would it cost the army to do that I want to sit there and go on the right hand side and talk about benefits for a second. This is the main emphasis as a program manager is building their CBA. What are the benefits that the Army will receive by putting in this new investment? <coughs> With the cost side, we're going to go down by element or resource or, new, or the new cost elements uh, within GFIBS and just lay that out. What are the inputs? But the hard part is to try to figure out, well, what do we gain for, what do we gain with this? And in essence, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, with the benefits, one of the key things that we want to sit there and emphasize is that this is where you're going to have to sit there and do that hard level of thinking. What is it, well, how do I solve the issue? And clearly, if it's quantifiable, if I can pull data from them too, and if I can explain how I'm going to improve productivity, if I can explain how I'm going to improve one of our key metrics, whether it's in the Army campaign plan, whether it's in CMS, that is a stronger argument <coughs> excuse me, than going along and pulling a non-quantifiable benefit. Let's go to the next slide. <coughs> As in with any decision brief, one of the first key steps is defining that problem and opportunity. And I'm just going to sit there and stress that. Many of us have been given a directed mission. And clearly, if the mission is coming from MECOM, MECOM should be sitting there and developing the concept plan. And one of the things we have to do is say, what, how do we actually solve, excuse me again, how do we solve uh, what exactly is the problem that we're trying to solve? Before we dive into how many people do I need to do the mission? I'm going to skip over uh, uh, step two, which is basically getting the facts and assumptions. And again, those, they're very important. Uh, but bottom line, they feed back into the problem in and of, its, of itself and dive into the alternatives. Just like any good decision brief, you should be coming to the table with three courses of action. And one of the things that I want to highlight about a good course of action is that it is not simply saying, well, I'm going to staff this office with military, and then course of action two is, I'm going to staff this office with civilians. And then course of action three is, I'm going to staff this, this office with just contractors. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the same course of action. Okay, maybe a little different mix, but that's the same course of action. So a good CBA that will get passed through MedCom, that will get passed through the Department of the Army, will come up with three distinct uh, alternatives, and each alternative needs to be costed out. 
what are the inputs that go into uh, the, those COAs. When we're looking at the costing process, a lot of people will immediately go out and grab the resource manager. The RM has to be involved. Absolutely. And, but one of the things is, is that the RM cannot tell you what are the requirements. That's the program manager. You've gotten your problem. You're coming up with some concepts on how to sit there and solve it. Based on that, now the RM can come to the table and assist you in pricing out how much to, if I if I got five if you think it needs five civilians, here's how much I can price that out. But the key is what are those individuals that are going to be what are those individuals going to be doing? Now here's one of the problems with the concept plan is that you can see it goes back and forth, back and forth. It is not a linear process. You will sit there and define your problem. You get your facts and assumptions. You come in with some alternatives. You come back to costing, but then you go wait one second. I got to go back and figure out. What exactly is the mission that I'm going to be trying to accomplish? So again, you're going to go. Be, you need a team that sits there and goes back and forth to develop these COAs and price these courses of action out. Okay. And at the end of the point, what you're going to do is you're going to have detailed, uh, basically miniature little budgets for each COA, and you're going to sit there and be able to explain based off the assumptions why this COA is different than another course of action. Let me go back to the benefits. <coughs> the benefits for this decision brief, the benefits become your selection criteria. Your benefits, how does each COA achieve the problem that you're trying to solve? And again, this goes back to just simple uh, what we learned in the Captain's Career Course or CASQ, where you're turning around and you're going to basically weight these benefits, which benefit is more important than another, and you're going to provide them a score. You add that up, and now you have a, now you have a, a benefit score for each and every single COA. Now, that's done primarily if you have non-quantifiable benefits. If you have something that's quantifiable, let's take, for example, productivity, RVUs, RWPs, something that we have a solid metric, that obviously has more uh, validity than doing the traditional uh, uh, decision matrix that we have traditionally used uh, within the Department of the Army. What I am showing you is what the, what the Department of the Army wants to see, uh, a decision matrix, and again, Taking what we've talked about, and again, this I would say I would recommend more for a non-quantifiable uh, presentation, uh, quantifiable benefits than something that I can actually pull out of M2 or another data system. For my criteria, those are the three benefits that I'm looking to solve a problem. I've weighted them. The error rate has the highest weight for each course of action. I'm turning around and I'm giving it a raw score and then a, and then basically based off that score times the weight, I have my new uh, weighted adjust score and I have total benefit scores. Please note the cost is on the bottom. The cost is not, is not one of my direct criteria. What I want to know is just, first of all I want to know is what's the benefit score overall? Not worried about money. Which item would be the most ideal? In this case, course of action one is the best one, 4.9. I add in the cost. I sit there and then come up with a, a CBI, a cost benefit index, kind of an indicator. And based on that, with low being the ideal, obviously course of action turns around and uh, is the optimal solution. Here are the references. There is an actual CBA guide. There are multiple templates. Uh, and at the cost and economic uh, website underneath the uh, financial management and comptroller, you can find additional resources along with uh, more information on the cost management concepts. This last slide are some of the available tools. You have the direct links for the tools, but you can also find this underneath the cost management portal.
And at this point in time, I am going to transfer uh, the brief back to Ms. D. Garza, and uh, I'll need to get her back on the phone here in just a second. Colonel Richard speaking. Sir, it's me. I got cut off. Not a problem. Not a problem. Thank you for coming back on, and you now have the uh, the brief is back to you. Okay. So if you look at the concept plan format after the CBA is completed, and the CBA will be included in the narrative, I just put it in there this way so that it wouldn't be so extensive. Uh, but the in the mission analysis, that that's self-explanatory of what is needed in there. Mission functions, so often the regulation says three to five functions, and we get pages of it. We, we don't need that. We need your major major category functions. What are you in business? What is your mission? Okay, and then the detailed mission analysis, you can explain a little more of what that is. Your execution date is the E date, but you have to give a justification as to why you need it, when you need it, especially if it's a uh, a fiscal year that's that's prior to the one that we're in. I gave you I gave, gave you a couple a little words here and there that you might can use. So you, it's a gift. You don't have to use any of it if you don't care to. Here's a manpower analysis and what it'll look like. This is what the functional task list looks like. There's also an example out there that uh, Sarah put out there for me, but. But this is this is basically it. I truncated it and showed you at the bottom where this is what the operational audit form looks like. Once you've you've put in all your duties and tasks and, and the totals come out, this is the way you add them up at the end. There are formulas in there, so when you're submitting workload, make sure you, that the formulas stay intact. Okay, then you describe the workload analysis, how you went about gathering the workload where you gathered your workload from, and, and th those kinds of things. The summary of changes tells us what, what you're willing to change, what you're wanting to change in the, in the end. How, what kind of personnel are you changing? Military, reserve, civilians, and, and contractors. Of course, right now we're not counting contractors hey, on Excuse me, Dean, this is Colonel Richards again. Um, Sir. Uh, if you could share your screen if you're, if you're walking through a uh, document. Right now, we don't see that. Sorry. It's no problem. Thank you. They're interested in the screen? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So hopefully you can see it. I was talking about the summary of changes. It's basically what changed as a part of this initiative. If there were any active components, if, if reserve were addressed, civilians, uh, Contractors, and I was about to say that that uh, contractors are not on the TDA anymore, but it doesn't mean contractors don't exist. So out of 20 requirements that you need, and you need at least 10 of those to be contractors, you're going to have to delineate that, and only 10 will go in the TDA. Okay, so then the military, uh, the manpower mix criteria, says you've looked at the DOD 1100-01, and you've, you've uh, read through the, the different codes there and have decided which best fits the mix of your or your resources in, in that functional area. And so you, it goes through and it looks at all the rest of the, the things. Like I said, we look at facilities, we look at requirements, funding is a big one, the organizational structure, Usually the TDA uh, doesn't change, but paragraph within the TDA changes unless we're standing up a TDA. Readiness impact, important. How will this move affect readiness, if at all? Units affected, the units, you list all the units by UIC and the official TDA name in there. Okay, any political sensitivities that you know of, if you're in a foreign country and, and uh, the government of that country uh, can, can throw you out or put you out of business, then you need to address that under political sensitivity. Okay, the point of contact are you first, the functional POC, and then myself, 
or or the analyst that works on it, and the uh, manpower box that you work through at, at your subordinate unit. And those are the enclosures that go with the with the. Uh, do I have any questions? Okay. Dee, this is Colonel Richards. We have several yes, questions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question for the group. And uh, you and I will sit there and do our best to try to answer it. And I think the, uh, the first question we get from uh, guest uh, Jimbo is, how enduring is enduring? Uh, I've seen some discussion on there that someone was saying four years. Can you address that and provide a little more clarity on the question? How enduring is enduring? And enduring is, is kind of a tricky thing, but it, it's any mission that it's, it's going to be needed throughout the existence of the organization, so to speak. Uh, anywhere from three to five years is enduring. We have we have many missions that were, were stood up and meant to be temporary. Uh, <clears throat> one of them was, was BRAC, but they were put on our on our TDAs as, as uh, permanent. And, and so then you, you kind of get stuck once the mission has been accomplished. So the, the idea is, is not to put missions on that uh, will not, in, that are temporary in nature. And it, Excellent. Kind of tell it. Yep, no, no that's, I think that sounds good. I think that kind of addresses it. Let me, um, let me go to the next question. This has come pre, uh, from several folks, and uh, I'm going to use the one from uh, North Regional Medical Command uh, Headquarters. They asked, will someone in MedCom produce the concept plans for mandated positions and structures? For example, is there an approved concept plan or is someone working the approved concept plan for the community-based medical homes? And let me, let me address that for just one second, and then I'll turn it back to you. Um, the answer is, is that uh, the driver, one of the main drivers for this class itself, and I believe for the, the vast majority of people that are participating, is that the Chief of Staff has put out during the Campaign Synchronization Working Group, which feeds into the AMED 2020 campaign plan, that if, um, as program managers are presenting their programs and they're saying, I'm looking for more resources, we, we've cut, one of the, the the statement from the chief of staff is if you're going to do that, then you need a concept plan. Um, many of these mandated programs or special programs are in that C, are in the C SWIG, and those are the ones that we're targeting. So we're looking at program managers to develop those concept plans. And again, that would be for things such as MICO, uh, PCMH, uh, IDES. Uh, those type of special programs. D, do you, do you have anything else to add to that? Yes, yes, sir. Just real quick, we are not the functional experts. We're manpower experts. So the the functional the C do up the concept plan. But on uh, CBMH, those will be addressed through the PSM model because that's primary care. Anything that is under model or study, we do not do a concept plan on because the model will come back around and adjust as, as your, your mission goes up or down uh, because of workload drops or population drops or whatever, or increases, that, that the reapplication of the model will take care of any, any necessary increases or decreases. So we wouldn't interfere with that. The concept plan is to stand up a new mission or to do a, a major reorganization, and it is good for one year. Because after one year, they're expected that you'll you'll have a study done on you after that, or a model. The plan's only good to stand stand things up. That's an excellent an excellent point. I did not know that. Yes. Um, Anything else? Let me go into the next question. Uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead and read this out, and I believe we've kind of a, uh, addressed it. Um, have the concept plans for CBMHs been provided to individual MTFs? Additionally, once facts and assumptions have changed, does MedCom revise its concept plan? I, I don't... That's addressed by the model. Okay. All right. And I think that statement about the model, concept plan goes up, it's a staffing document. After that, 
it, yes. it's supposed to be replaced by a new manpower model. Or study. Or study. Okay. The concept plan is a one-time good deal. Okay. All right. And the permission. Um, will someone at Medcom produce? Uh, okay, we we've already covered that. Sounds like someone wants to put me to work. Yeah. Um, not sure if you're following the chat string. Is there a reason that Medcom doesn't submit in mass TDA changes for command directed program? Okay, we've just addressed that. Um, are the Medcom approved concept plans in a library we can access so we can't so we do not reinvent the wheel for similar requirements? Yes, sir. We do have a URL that, that we can provide for anyone interested in, in doing a concept plan. In fact, I would advise that before you endeavor into such a labor intensive process that you call us and let's talk it through. We might be able to do it to to do what it is you want to do through another uh, methodology like the command implementation plan, the TDA update. So so just call us. Okay. Um, is equal value in the BCA uh, I'm assuming the CBA given to a positive ROI to the MHS, meaning lower lowering bag to cost by specifically Army. I that the I believe what would happen is as we put together a a cost benefit analysis, and let's say we're taking a look at purchase care, and we're showing that there is a savings. That's going to that's going to go up to the Department of the Army, and so we're going to make an argument to the Department of the Army that this initiative, and again, a return on investment is not what a what a command budget estimate or excuse me excuse me cost benefit analysis is looking at. It's looking at given a an investment, will there be additional benefits? And if it can sit there and lower cost, that's nice. The Army might sit there and turn around and say, well, you're not really lowering my cost, my direct cost. You're lowering the cost of another payer. So we might have less of an argument. Okay, let me go to the next question. Sir, if I might make a next yes. little comment. Please, please. The, the CBA is designed to completely cost out the mission, the new mission that we're right. trying to of the entire cost of what this is going to cost. To, to include the military? Yes, sir. Correct. Correct. Uh, and again, that goes back to the comments that it's not really a cost saving or a cost avoidance Correct. drill. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, yes. Uh, someone asked a question, can we get Lieutenant Colonel Richards' PowerPoint on the file? Uh, share site. Actually, I believe it's in the main PowerPoint, um, and we'll definitely uh, push out all the products that we have. Um, can Lieutenant Colonel Richards address how the how he determines weight? Um, absolutely, weight is determined. Uh, th there's multiple ways, but in essence, the action officer, uh, just like a decision brief. The action officer is going to determine that weight, and clearly that comes back from whoever the decision authority is. Let's take those um, in the presentation that, that I had shown. There were three things uh, in this example. It was cycle time, error rate, ease of use. The action officer, uh, based off listening to the decision authority, said for some reason that error rate was more important. And so the action officer gave that a higher weight. So again, that's between the action officer and, and, and in our case, let's say it's the commanding general. Commanding general says, this is where I want to put the emphasis. Sir, may I? Yes, please. Um, a lot of the criteria that we see coming through here is, is are things like personnel, military, civilian, contractors, uh, facilities, because they're, they're costing out these things, or, or mission, or, or is there a, a production thing involved? Um, so we weight those things 
according to, to what is more important to the commander. Correct. So that, that's how you weight them, folks. If, if it's more important for you to accomplish your mission within a short amount of time, then you would weight mission higher than you would personnel or, or things of that nature. Right, right. It always comes back to the commander guidance. Um, which should be back, tied back to strategic guidance from the Department of the Army and, and also from uh, the MHS. Uh, question, um, how did you arrive at the CBI from the weighted scores and the cost? Um, that was just simply taking the cost divided by the total benefit score. In this example, it was 12.5 divided by 4.9. That gets you to a CBI of 2.5. Okay. Um, next question. If our organization's TDAs are completely out of date, does this process need to be done for each division department within the hospital or as an overall concept plan placed? Dee, I'm going to let you take that one. Next question, do we need to produce a concept plan in order to realign existing authorizations to support command-directed initiatives, such as PCMH, IDAs, et cetera? So, um, authorizations can be moved around. The, the uh, commander has the authority to move authorizations around, provided they're not authorizations uh, from a, well, I'm thinking requirement. I was thinking from a model. But, but yes, the, the commander has the authorization. As long as you don't change the AMSCO, AMDEP, uh, or, or the personnel type, or the PER type, as it's written on the TDA, uh, you should be OK. But, and, and in fact, a, a commander has or should have the latitude to move uh, to, to reprioritize as, as missions become lower in, in priority and that kind of thing, should be able to move things around. However, I, I just need to, to do the analysis of that. I, I forgot what I was going to say. Anything else? Did I, did I address that? Uh, oh, oh, I know what I was going to say, sir. Okay. It, it makes a difference if you're moving from one UIC to another. Because if you're within your own TDA, you're good. But if you start moving from one, one UIC to another, it, it requires a, our programmer, a command plan programmer, to, to submit a Schedule 8 to make that change happen up at Army level. So, Remember, we have Army documents, and we just use it to track our resources. So, so another way to put that, D, is that a concept plan is one of multiple tools within the manpower arena. And we have things such as the command plan, concept plans, manpower studies. And then during the programming uh, cycle, whether we're doing the total Army analysis, which feeds into the POM process, we, we can make adjustments through a Schedule 8. So if you're just simply realigning resources, no, you don't need to necessarily do a concept plan. 
but you do need to do one uh, some some form of a um, manpower uh, adjustment. Yes, sir. When we're talking requirements, you can move requirements under the office of a command implementation plan or under the PDA update. When we're talking authorizations, you can move them during a, a TDA update uh, or, a, or an okay. RMD directed by the command plan manager. The concept plan is not used, sir, to move authorizations at all unless they're being used as bill pairs. Okay. Here's another good question, um, and I think this goes back to some historical uh, issues. The issue that keeps arising it, uh, for existing missions back in 2008, like the call center that were mandated, and none of the call centers are on the TDA. Some commands are, are cutting uh, these crucial areas. Will there be a ClinOps ASAM model coming out? Well, sir, first of all, ASAM is no longer a valid model. Uh, Army has deemed that as, as an invalid model because it was based on population at the time when it was when it was uh, developed. The model that we're using now is, is though the process is similar, it, it's called the automated workload. But I forget what the other staffing model. Awesome. That's a Dr. Perry invention. But but back to the call centers, what kind of call centers are we talking about? Are those IT call centers? Because if they are, those were consolidated at USAMITIC, and those resources should have been uh, I, I think consolidated we're talk, up at... I think we're talking about patient appointing. Oh, patient, patient appointments, yes. Well, I think they got a, an automated system as well. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to okay. talk to the uh, individual. Uh, next question is, um, how many, and I'm, I'm assuming average, how many uh, manpower hours would it take to develop the average concept plan? No, <laughs> It depends on the complexity of the concept plan. If you have a concept plan that's straightforward, directorate level, uh, you have a clear and concise functionality. You've been keeping workload. Uh, you have a good mission directive. Uh, it, it, it is labor intensive. If you still have to do a, a TDA crosswalk, you still have to do a cost benefit analysis. Whether you're doing it for one requirement or 20, you have to do the same work kind of like the people that have a small TDA and then the medical centers, you still have to go through the same processes of balancing and, and so forth. But um, it, it takes, a, and, and again, if you have a concept plan that's going to stretch out across the United States, different, different components, little work centers or, or satellites that are going to be out there, we have to ensure there's derivative UIC. We have to ensure there's orders to back it up. We have to ensure these people have a, a, a reporting, you know, uh, the c commanders that rate them and, and so on and so forth. It, it, it's extensive. So average for, for us is about 450 hours. Okay, and that's when it gets to your level? Yes. So before that, the, the proponent who's putting this together has to do this decision brief, the CBA, and then has to turn around and do um, kind of like what we just did with the baseline document to figure out what are the functions and how many people, how many hours, and try to quantify that. Um, and then along with that comes getting all the additional documents and packaging this before they even send it to your office. And the workload analysis is, is labor intensive as well. Right. The, the actual functional task. We, we very often will set aside three, two, three hours at a time to sit with a functional and, and, and walk them through the functional analysis. Once they've developed it, to, to help them, you know, make any corrections that appear blatant or that we know USIMA is, is, is uh, 
is probably not going to accept or or we ask them to consider looking at this, that, or the other, or if you know, this function may impact that function, and, or, or it seems so similar, can we combine, and those kinds of things. That's why it takes us 450 hours, depending on the size of the concept plan. It could take us, or the experience of the person developing it, it, it could take a considerable amount of time. Understood. Next question, um, I think this is a financial one. What are the approved sources for determining personnel costs, such as PCS costs derived from the initiative? Um, what I've done, ladies and gentlemen, you should see a, a slide up now that says available tools and models for cost data. In yellow is the Army Military Civilian Cost System. Uh, that is the approved uh, site. And going down in the, in the little, on the bottom of this slide, where it says access links to resources, you can sit there and get, you can access that same portal through uh, that link as well. Going to the next question. Uh, how long does it take the concept plan to work through the system, then, uh, then requirements end up on a TDA? So I think we kind of answered that with the prep work from the proponent, then getting to MedCom concept plan division at, at within uh, Manpower. So D, from that statement, how long does DA take to do their analysis once they received uh, a concept plan? It, it can take us, just to back up a little bit, it can take us anywhere from three months to a year. And, and that, again, is because sometimes we get the concept plan all ready to go, and then there's an out of cycle that occurs and it takes us right back to redoing all the crosswalks on the, on the, on the concept plan uh, uh, proposed TDA. So any number of things could trigger us having to start again. Um, just, just to give you an idea of why it can take so long. But if, if, the, if the planets are all aligned and all is well, we, we can get it out of here between three and six months. And then it takes 90 days, at, give or take, at Army level. And then once Army has, has issued their approval memo, FEMSA is, is almost, in, they, they schedule the next available out of cycle. OK. So it can take a little better than a year or so. And that's, and that's from start to finish with? Yes, sir. With, with Department of the Army included? Yes, sir. OK. Um. Next question here is, we have tried to submit a TDA changes over the last few years and have, and have been told we couldn't. Um, and I believe we need some more information on, on that specific question. It depends on how, it would, how those changes were, were uh, uh, what mechanism they were put on. Sure. Yes? I, I would advise that they talk, that this is not really the form for the TDA changes. That would Laura Shaw, Dr. Shaw, uh, she's the document uh, chief, documents branch chief. Because what I'm hearing is TDA change is not necessarily a, a, a concept plan or a, a command implementation plan. Okay. Uh, I believe we just have two questions left. Um, next question is uh, reference the threshold slide when new military when it says new military requirement. Is this speaking to a mission requirement? Yes. OK. Uh, next person from uh, Public Health Command. Our experience has been that the first concept plan you create takes much longer than succeeding ones. And I, I believe that would make sense. Yes. OK. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the questions that I see. I am monitoring to see if there's anything else on the chat. And I'm at this point in time. I'm going to uh, turn it back over to you, Dee, for um, uh, additional comments. And I then believe we go back to Ms. Ryan. All right. I just want to say that it is a labor-intensive uh, uh, endeavor. So uh, anyone that is, is thinking of doing a concept plan, uh, get, give us a call, and, and we'll help you get, get you started. And uh, I have the best staff in the MedCom, but we won't go there. 
and uh, they are they are very helpful. And, and so, Sarah, thank you as well for the opportunity to do this. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We do appreciate you coming. Uh, we have an incredibly large number of attendees today, so we hope that you got something useful out of this. I know Ms. Garza has offered to be of assistance to anyone who needs help as they're working on their concept plan. So um, we'll offer additional training as she tells us they're necessary to answer any questions that keep coming up. Uh, I'll send a notice out when we have our next Aspire series on the calendar. We have a few brewing, but nothing formal. So uh, thanks again for joining us, and we'll have the recorded session available in the next couple days.